Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Sierra Club of Pennsylvania summer webinar series. My name is Jim Wiley. I'm the chair of the uh, Pennsylvania Sierra Club. Um, I'm sure we are well versed in Zoom etiquette by now. Please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Uh, you are invited to introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us uh, what county you live in. I expect we all will have a good representation from across the state today. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please, please drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll have plenty of time in the second half hour to work through these and, and maybe open things up for discussion. Uh, just a little context in February of this year, um, this uh, Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club formed eight conservation teams as shown in the diagram. These teams can be viewed in the context of overall sustainability, climate change, and education about these broader topics. Of course, sustainability rests on the pillars of people, planet, and profit. And in Pennsylvania, we have a support system of staff and volunteers to help each of our teams with equity, political outings, and communications assistance, as well as legal assistance, the Clean Energy for All campaign, and a bit of grant funding for worthy causes. All eight of the chapter conservation teams can be found on the Pennsylvania website, where you'll find each team's mission statement, priorities for this year, and all kinds of info on these issues issue areas developed by our volunteer teams with the help of chapter and national staff. All of our teams have the general mission of looking at their respective uh, issue from a statewide perspective, tracking relevant Pennsylvania policy and legislation and supporting group and local volunteers working in this space. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Jack Miller, who's on our food and agriculture team uh, Jack. Good evening. Uh, as Jim said, my name is Jack Miller, uh, part of our newly formed uh, Ag Committee. And basically, we look at issues, whatever issues related to Ag come up. Our speaker, our presenter tonight is Hawa Lasana. She is the founding founder and managing editor of the Discerning Eye Community Ag, which is a nonprofit uh, devoted to promoting uh, agriculture within an urban setting. So, how uh, teach us, learn, learn us a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> sure. Let me learn you some things. No, I'm joking, but thank you, Jack, for the introduction. And um, I will start by uh, sharing my screen. Creation. So my name is Hala Lasana and I am in fact the managing director and founder of Discerning Eye Community Agriculture, um, which is a local nonprofit. Let's see. I, I shared it. You oh, just yeah. tell me when to, oh, when to go to the next slide. Oh, perfect. Well, um, as this loads, I will also let you all know that if you'd like to find out more information about DECA, um, we are available to be seen and um, on Facebook at facebook.com backslash DECA City Farms. We're also on Instagram at DECA City Farms. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. And the next slide, please. Okay. Okay. So, everyone, <laughs> we are ready. Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us today and um, thank the Sierra Club for leading these really important conversations about conservation particularly around food and agriculture. And uh, also I'd like to give my gratitude for uh, the sharing of your large platform, uh, which gives us you know, a lot of visibility and uh, allowing me to speak on my journey about becoming an urban farming advocate. So thank you to everyone involved. 
And as you can see here, we have just a little bit of an agenda. I know we uh, lost some time here in the beginning, so I'll try and make it through everything and maybe we'll uh, pause um, or skip the break in the middle. But I'll start with a bit of an introduction about myself and how I ended up in front of you today and then uh, move on to the development and evolution of DECA from concept to action. And then what we have planned for the future and how everyone can help. Um, again, this will be recorded. So if anyone would like uh, to access this after the fact, uh, you can contact Jim and uh, I'm sure he'll have the recording up on YouTube. Now, uh, also, um, can everyone hear me okay? Just a little thumbs up. Yeah, yes. Perfect. Great. Now, if you have any questions about anything that I say or any terms that I use, feel free to raise your hand and I can see it um, down below. Right below the screen here, uh, there's three dots and that'll say more. You can either enter the chat there and you can also raise your hand there as well. Um, feel free to ask questions during the presentation. And if we're not able to get to it during the uh, actual time I'm speaking, we'll get to it at the end. Okay, does that sound agreeable to everyone? Thumbs up? Great. Okay. So next slide, please. <laughs> That's me. My name is Hawa. And I am a first generation African American. Uh, my mother was born and raised in the capital city of Accra, Ghana, in Africa. And my father is Liberian, born and raised in a small village um, named after his grandfather, actually, called Sensi Town, which is north of Monrovia. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. There's a little map of uh, those areas and arrows pointing to uh, Liberia and Ghana. Uh, they actually met on a Pan Am flight. My mom was a flight attendant and my dad was a captain for the Merchant Marines. Uh, so a little bit of background about who I am and where I come from, but coming forward now, it wasn't until my adulthood that I, you know, did the family tree research and shared stories after reconnecting with my estranged father. Um, and that's when I learned a bit more about my family and where I came from, uh, that my maternal grandfather, my mother's father, was a preacher and a community leader in his Christian community in Accra. And my paternal grandfather, my father's father, was an imam. He was a Muslim community leader in his village. Uh, also, I found out that my grandmothers and other members of the family were farmers, naturalists, and healers. So although both sets of my grandparents uh, passed before I was born and I really haven't had a chance to meet much of my extended family, I really found this connection to be just so soothing and inspiring to recognize my familial connection to like this divine spirit really validated a concept that I was taught at a really young age. Um, since I was young, I've known that I was destined for greatness. Um, I was raised by my mother who um, decided to stay in the United States after birthing me um, to offer me a better life and better opportunities than I would have had in Ghana or Liberia. And although it wasn't spoken of specifically really, um, I was imbued with like a knowing, if you will, of my destiny. Um, being a first generation black woman in America, I, I wasn't raised with the cultural stories or inherited traumas of many others that, that look like me, right? But even still, um, the outside factors and the opinions of others and the systemic oppression really of being a black woman in America for 40 something years really forced um, an intermittent uh, questioning or like doubting of my fate. But there was a truth that was imparted to me and um, it wasn't spoken of often, but it was a quiet knowing and one that I knew really deeply. 
I knew that by the example of my family, that our legacy was our inherent power of stewardship, which manifested as care for community, care for country, and care for the earth and its natural systems. You can uh, go to the next slide, please. But uh, I'll say it wasn't until about 2019 when I began to inquire about this truth uh, behind everything that I felt so deeply in my heart, but I really couldn't see in my world in real life. And after various leadership courses, uh, 900 hours of yoga teacher training uh, through K Karma and the Yoga Sanctuary School, personal development courses like Landmark International, um, that's when I finally began to step into my own leadership. Mm -hmm through connecting with and quieting my mind and calming the unrest of my body, I began to see the connection between my own personal traumas and the stories I was telling myself about myself and about my world and how these things really uh, just like grew my inability to realize the, the vastness of my own possibility. I was blind to it, I would say, due to all those things. So from then on, I began to look at my life through the lens of my own personal wellness and the wellness of communities as entities, right? So next slide, please. Everyone has heard of wellness, like, you know, we, we hear about it, but really what, what exactly does that even mean? Um, and I'm just gonna have a little aside here to Jim. This is an animation, so we'll just click through it slowly, okay? So um, before we do that, okay, does anyone know any more aspects of wellness besides the mental aspect? Um, and feel free to just like throw it in the chat box quick. We'll just have a few seconds to, if you have any guesses and then I'll continue on. But uh, again, depending on your view or which um, organizations you're working with, uh, there's anywhere from six to 12 aspects of wellness, creativity, that's a great one. Does anybody else have any guesses? Okay, we can go ahead. Ooh, yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah, Tim Beckham. Yes, I see at least four there and I think you're right on, but we will continue on. Go ahead, Jim, you can click through. We have the mental engagement with the world and uh, learning problem solving and creativity, right? You got that one. There's the environmental aspect. You can continue to click through, Jim. Thank you. The physical aspects. You all can read that on your screen. I, I don't have to continue on just because we are short on time a little bit, but there's a spiritual aspect social aspects and emotional aspects of wellness. Um, next slide, please, Jim. So I personally, sorry, you can go back one. And I personally began to look at each aspect of my life um, in the micro and look at the community in the macro view in order to solve the problem of discovering my greatness, right? So next slide, please. And the investigation led me to believe in myself and my silly inclinations and understand how my chosen interests were actually primers to a bigger story, how to listen to my intuition, and really diverge from the voices fueled by my fears, right? Embrace the challenge of the journey and really reach for the edges of what was possible for my life and for my community. So I have this little um, seat here that I find really helpful and I often give to young people. Um, I haven't really had a chance to share it in any other uh, capacity, but it was really helpful for me to just understand and encapsulate what I wanted to do with my life. Um, 
And it begins with just making a list of your hobbies or your interests or what you like to do. And then maybe putting them into two categories, right? And for me, finding that center line between all of those things really helps me help to inform my next steps. And what it ended up looking like was tradition meeting innovation. Next slide, please. So I began to manifest my possibility, as they say. I knew food systems were really important to me. And uh, a few years previous, as you see in 2015, um, as the director, I was the director of the Boys and Girls Club here in Lancaster, the Jack Walker Clubhouse. Um, we had a little garden in the back and it was a sunflower garden. We replaced that, which only really had aesthetic value to uh, begin a vegetable and fruit garden that could be used for uh, education and engagement for the kids as well as wellness, right? By digging, planting, watering, solving the problems of figuring out like what to do um, when the plants aren't looking too good. Uh, pruning, harvesting, sharing, and eating juicy, flavorful, and delicious like tomatoes or strawberries. And that tasted way different than what they were used to in their fast food meals, right? The, the tomato in the Burger King Big Mac or, you know, Whopper tastes much different than a tomato grown in your own backyard. And it was, it was such an experience. We would add freshly sliced tomatoes and fresh basil to our Domino's pizza on pizza day Fridays. And the kids would dare each other to eat the produce, right? Only the bravest, <laughs> only the bravest and the most outgoing would make just like a huge dramatic affair out of it. But like, you won't eat that tomato, you won't eat that but it really didn't matter what their social response was. The most important thing is that they were eating nutrient dense produce and enjoying it from beginning to end. Next slide, please. So uh, beginning this entire endeavor helped me to seek out and identify community partners who could help with building gardens and who were, had these similar interests. So I partnered with uh, Lancaster Urban Farming Initiative run by Brendan Stamen, um, who currently runs Sidetrack Farms, uh, producer of the count, some of the county's finest hemp uh, and also uh, a community partner in pro providing us produce for our pop-up pay what you can farmer's market, which I'll talk about a little later. But uh, seeking community partners was really the ticket to our success. Um, finding folks who were just as dedicated to food justice and willing to do the work involved was really like finding a diamond in a minefield. Like the key was finding folks who were prepared to invest in the community and invest in the strengths of their own ideas like I had learned to do. Um, folks who can connect with others and see the bigger picture. That was really the goal. So uh, Brandon, who's pictured uh, there in the yellow, and Luffy, also known, uh, were also known as LRI, Lancaster Urban Rooftop Initiative. And that name may or may not sound familiar to anyone who's familiar with the Lancaster or downtown Lancaster scene. Uh, TELUS 360, which is a pretty popular location right downtown, uh, just posted today, I think it's actually their uh, maybe five or six year anniversary of the installation of their green roof, which Luffy was um, one of the first to begin that conversation in Lancaster. And uh, so it was really exciting just to see Telus um, bring that memory back today. So if you are on Instagram, take a look at that because it's pretty cool. So next slide, please, Jim. This is the video. So um, it also to continue the quest uh, for 
um, community partners, I signed up for PASA to connect uh, to more folks who had spent their careers in dedicated to sustainable agriculture. Uh, PASA, if you're not familiar, is the Pennsylvania Sustainable Agriculture Conference, and that was held for the first time in 2020 um, in downtown Lancaster at the conference center. So that was pretty exciting and very much, I mean, I really felt like the universe had stepped in at that point because I was determined to learn as much as I possibly could about farming, about sustainable agriculture, and um, I'll get into some of the uh, hurdles that I faced at the time, but um, having this conference right at my doorstep couldn't have made and it couldn't have been any easier and it was really just a godsend. So next slide, please. Do you want me to play this video? Yeah, it's okay. It's actually, there's not much video there to see, so that's okay. We can just move on. Oh, okay. So in PASA, I had uh, volunteered my time in order to attend uh, the conference for free. I took full advantage of every class, every workshop, every info session I could to gain as much information from the pros as possible. Uh, best practices for community gardens, um, aquaponics 101, even though I'd had a pretty good understanding of that already. Uh, health code and safety regulations zoning and working with the city to acquire and regulate space for growing. And uh, more than anything, finding others in my community who shared my interests in order to expand the community that I was trying to build. Uh, next slide, please. So at this point after PASA, I had really begun to it's funny to use the phrase, but concretely visualize what DECA could be and how it could affect change in our community. And it began with this premise. How can I make gardening, or I should say garden farming, easy for somebody with a little bit of experience, accessible for any budget, engaging for the mind, energy efficient, and creating zero to low waste, and also uh, creating community around food. So those were the main premises um, that really sparked the beginning of DECA. And my mind started to reel along with my computer screen, just searching out innovative methods to create each aspect of this vision, um, including our big idea, which uh, will hopefully come out by 2023. Um, if you can see in the lower uh, right hand corner of the screen there. Um, that is our inspiration uh, from a company called FarmPod that is out in um, the Dominican Republic right now. They started out in New Mexico and they are the only company and soon I will be adding DECA to that list, that short list of companies creating um, self-contained energy self-sufficient micro farms. Um, so I'm really excited for this future here and we, will, uh, we won't get more into that today, but if you continue to follow DECA on our social media, you'll hear all about it. So uh, now I had all these great ideas of sustainable farming, like you can see here, uh, growing vegetables in, gutters and uh, five gallon buckets, but I had nowhere to practice. Um, and it became clear to me the underlying issue behind all of this work. Next slide, please. And it was that access to green space was a privilege. Now, I and, and notice that's like a, a big old stop sign because that's what it felt like. Um, first of all, let's be clear, okay, although race and racial justice are not the overt topics for today, it goes without saying that when we're talking about urban farming, we have to be clear about what we're saying. Uh, we're creating a conversation about growing food, often in densely populated spaces, often populated by those of low or lower than average means, who on average 
tend to be members of a BIPOC population, right? So just like, let's be clear on what we're talking about. So uh, urban farming um, is also defined differently than community gardening. Um, again, depending on where you look, uh, people will have different answers, but it really doesn't matter to me for our intents and purposes. The only difference worth noting, as far as I'm concerned, is that gardening, I'm sorry, that our intent is to feed a lot of people. And linguistically, from what people understand, that happens on a farm, right, as opposed to a garden. So what we've done, and many others who are doing this kind of work as well, have amalgamated the phrase to help people understand what it is that we're really doing, and uh, particularly what we're doing with DECA and our sister companies, and that is Garden Farm. So it's a place that you could have in your backyard or a shared space that can feed more than one household. And I think that's the, really the most important distinction between what we're doing and community gardening. Uh -oh. So uh, whatever I was building had to be cost effective, um, accessible for most people, including uh, include the most people as possible and increase the levels of wellness in my community. Uh, so not only were my efforts rooted in learning the best growing techniques, they also included uh, environmental stewardship, food justice, creating agency and inclusion for underserved communities, independent of what they look like or where they came from. Uh, underserved communities are widespread. And Jack, you know, you mentioned just earlier you're having a presentation on uh, uh, vegan or plant-based food diets for folks in um, retirement homes. Uh, that is an underserved community as well. So just to be clear, underserved and at-risk communities look very different all over the place. So um, our goals again are to build strong networks, fortifying both at-risk and forward-thinking communities forward thinking communities and building a sustainable Lancaster and beyond. But I ran into a pretty big setback in the very beginning. Like I said, I needed a place to practice. And uh, we did skip ahead a little bit, but I'll, so this isn't a picture, but what I'll say is where I was living at the time, I only had about a fire escape size patio. And I realized I probably wasn't the only one. Area friends to see who had farms or rural spaces that I could, uh, you know, practice growing and, and practice these methods so I could become an expert myself. I reached out to a local hydroponics farm to offer myself and support and a learning capacity like an intern. And then I realized, like many others living in urban spaces, uh, I didn't have access to a vehicle. So, how could I even reliably? begin to experiment and bring these ideas to life if I couldn't even get to the places <laughs> where I needed to be. Like, uh. So then, you know, so many setbacks and I was really confident in my idea, but these hurdles just kept on coming up out of nowhere and things I hadn't considered as factors that stood in the way of completion that were beyond my control. You know, it was enough to make most people give up, but not me. <laughs> My mom taught me resourcefulness above and beyond anything. And sometimes what that looks like is seeing windows where there were walls, recognizing opportunity, even if that means like big and uncomfortable change. So to the slide we're on currently, uh, the universe stepped in, as I like to say, and a friend of mine asked me to take care of her house. Um, if anyone's familiar with Lancaster, that is right on the edge of Northwest Corridor Park, overlooking the park. It's a beautiful location. And um, it required some major change in my life to be able to do that. Uh, but I was ready to leave my comfortable but unfulfilling and unsustainable lifestyle to uh, truly dedicate myself to my ideals. And this was the perfect place for phase one a household 
hydroponic proof of concept. Next slide, please. So um, a month after I moved into this place, COVID actually began to ravage the entire world. And it was a tumultuous time where nothing was certain anymore. And the strength of our systems, including our food systems came into question. And I knew it was the time to make my efforts public and put them up for consideration for in front of a jury of my peers. I had already signed up for a uh, and was attending the Assets Business Plan Incubator class. Um, Assets is a nonprofit based in Lancaster that does everything they can to help entrepreneurs and small business people thrive in the community. Um, so a uh, huge resource there for anybody who is looking to uh, follow in the same footsteps. So, um, but COVID, like I said, came in like a wrecking ball and everything stopped. Our classes stopped everything. Um, but I knew we had to begin our efforts in public in a really real way, in an impactful way. We as a human community needed new ideas fast. We needed new frameworks and new traditions surrounding how our communities and others like it could fortify ourselves against the chaos and the fragility of these mega systems that were breaking. We needed to fortify our micro systems, neighbor by neighbor, household by household. Next slide, please. So this was the beginning then of uh, Backyard Farm and Cooperative and the formation of our team. Uh, I reconnected with my colleague and fellow community and food justice leader, Elliot, the Mad Gardener Martin, who helped pave the way for our first downtown delivery of our CSA service. Next slide, please. Now, uh, just a little bit of a background in order to work with a partner in a business or a nonprofit, um, I came up to probably a at helping uh, in line, and it was our uh, project alignment sheet. Um, uh -oh, that keep happening. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, of course when looking at, can everybody hear me still? Okay, I'm just having a little bit of computer issue here. So of course, when looking for a partnership in a company, you have to make sure that your messages align. And the best way to do that I found was with this type of alignment sheet where you could sort of uh, address problems before they came before they became issues or before they became irreconcilable. So it consisted of questions like, um, what are your what are the values behind the project that you want to begin? What are your long term goals? Uh, how will it make money? Does it need to make money? All of these types of questions. So we took a proactive look at what we were about to step into and um, really uh, tackled it together. And, and I think that was, that was a really way to uh, help the process of the formation of DECTA. Uh, next slide, please. And I just will say I'm having a little bit of problem with my computer, so I'm going to go to my phone to continue the speech. Okay, Jim, can you get the next slide? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if I can do that. There we go. So 
we began with Elliot's already established farm plot, which was behind a neighborhood in New Holland. And uh, by this time, Elliot had already established himself as one who gives gifts of food and labor to his community. Uh, much of his efforts uh, were led or fed his local Christian community members and Christian organizations committed to similar goals. Um, he's also, sort of a side note, uh, a big proponent of the gift economy where labor and goods are given freely and it's up to the receiver to uh, assign an appropriate value for the exchange. And although it sounds wild and we had our arguments and conversations about it, uh, that system sustained him in a way that was uh, to the extent that he desired. So it worked for him and um, it actually helped inform a lot of how we move forward as well. Just, uh, being able to show and prove that there's another way to do things. Next slide, please, Jim. So we began to deliver via bicycle our abundant CSA shares and um, gains. Okay. We were able to gain support from the community for the seeds of this idea and expand our product offerings in, able, in order to begin creating a sustainable revenue stream. Uh, next slide, please. The products include microgreen pesto, black garlic butter, black garlic salt, black garlic paste, and then our most popular product was infused honeys that are raw and local with flavors like cardamom, thyme, ginger, rose petal, chamomile, just really great stuff. And um, the sales of these products helped to give a foundation for the entire pro uh, project. Uh, it was important to me to structure the business in a very specific way uh, similar to Newman's Own, if you all are familiar with that brand, where our for-profit companies feed um, their portion of their profits to the nonprofit branch so that we could continue engaging in community revitalization projects without going broke. Next slide, please. So what we created was a conglomerate of three sister companies, Backyard Farming Cooperative, Deca City Provisions, and Deca City Farms, that focus on the three aspects of the fresh food industry. Access to growing space, urban micro farming and sales, and hyperlocal value-added food production. And the nonprofit Discerning Our Community Agriculture really centered our environmental stewardship in community activism. Now, to me, the structure of this whole idea is just as important as the work that we're actually doing in the community. Again, it was an example of a scalable social enterprise that holds the triple bottom line, as Jim mentioned earlier, we share the same values. Profits, people, planet. Not specifically in that order. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we used the structure to build a successful community garden farm at the Boys and Girls Club. This was in 2020, um, and it's been running for two seasons now. Uh, we've also begun talks with the Emerald, Emerald Center on Oregon Pike, the Lancaster City uh, Police Department, the YWCA, Lancaster's Health and Safety Department, and Lancaster Central Market um, to develop our ideas and make sure that healthy and safe food can be available in the places that it's needed the most. And I hope Jim can still hear me <laughs> to get to the next slide. <laughs> well, maybe we'll be able to come back to it uh, when he gets back, but I'll continue on. Um, and you can see the flyer for what I'm about to mention. Um, another initiative that is gaining so much momentum right now is our pop-up pay what you can farmers market. 
Um, Jim, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So along with our partner, Sidetrack Farms, who I mentioned earlier, um, we gather fresh produce from our farm plot in uh, Lancaster County Park. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. And uh, also partner farms in a 30 mile radius to provide an outlet for produce that would otherwise have ended up in a compost file, pile or fed to livestock which is sort of unbelievable when we think about how many people in the city are, are food insecure and um, almost the, f it seems flippant for the farmers to feed, you know, 50 pounds, 50 cases of cabbages to the pigs and horses when there's people in town that could use it. But farmers often are too busy with their daily operations, I know this now too, even as an urban farmer, to source and coordinate the distribution of excess produce. So again, it often just goes to waste. So we're very thankful to Sidetrack Farms to begin uh, creating this pipeline for excess produce, uglies and seconds to be able to make their way downtown so that everybody can eat. Next slide, please. So I mentioned our farm plot. Um, yeah, pay what you can example is working out so well. Sorry, I'm just gonna offshoot here for Peggy's uh, comment. Um, it has been wonderful. So we've had one market so far this past Sunday. We'll have another one this Sunday, every Sunday. So if you're in Lancaster on a Sunday, come visit. But uh, yeah, we receive so much support and people are just spreading the word and are just really, really supportive. So I'm just, I'm over the moon about the possibilities of where, how this could grow. What I would love to see and what I'm working towards is a community garden in every quadrant of the city and a corresponding farmer's market as well. Um, and we're working towards that step by step. Back to the slide presentation. So this is our farm plot, um, April 16th, 2021. So this was mm, what, uh, four months ago, not even. Okay, next slide, please. And this is a video. And there's music, so um, if you're having headphones, just it might be a little loud, so be careful. Uh, so April 17th was the day of our, um, of the great social enterprise pitch, the assets um, business plan contest. That was April 16th. We won third place, which we're very excited about. And April 17th, we had a volunteer day um, at the farm plot and had a wonderful group of folks out to help build and uh, create this vision that we had um, all seen and um, wished for our community. Um, the space though now has not only become a proof of concept plot that you can grow a lot of food in a small space, with accessible materials like pallets and, you know, uh, weed block that that was that stuff is cheap and tarps and uh, five gallon buckets. So not only has the space become a proof of concept plot, uh, but it also has become a bit of a sanctuary. Uh, I offer volunteer sessions via Calendly, which is an app or a website that you can go to. And uh, within the framework of my availability, folks can sign up at their leisure up to 60 days in advance of the date that they'd like to volunteer. Um, and it becomes really simple, really easy. There's a whole lot less face to face or communication issues. You just sign up and I'll meet you there and then we get to work. So um, I will mention how to do that at the end. But uh, I've witnessed personally, the yes it is. Lancaster is indeed a great city. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I've been able to witness 
personally, the sense of peace, the awareness, the mindfulness, the connection that inherently occurs in the space because folks are getting their hands in the dirt, because they feel like they have a purpose for the work that they're doing. And it benefits not only themselves, but the entire community. Um, and I personally would like to open up that space even more to particularly traumatized or marginalized groups like vets or children or anybody really, so that they can experience the benefits of working for purpose. Um, with the earth and within the cycles that occur that are larger than us. Um, so that is really important to me to continue to propagate in the space. So um, I'm just going to be conscious of time and skip some stuff. So uh, Jim, we can go to the la the next slide, which is the last slide. Oh, sorry, one back. Yes, so a little bit of a recap, talking about my journey to, thanks, Alyssa. Uh, I've enjoyed talking about this <laughs> and I will talk about it um, on and on and on and on. And you'll see that's one of my final points. But in the recap, uh, this has been my experience. It just wants to find a way to uh, participate. You can do it. Big ideas take big thinking. Don't be afraid of the work. So you can see my, my final points here. A little bit of a recap. Determine your connection to the work. If it's not a passion, it's not worth it. Discover wellness for yourself. It will release so much of the friction of doubt that inevitably happens. But once you are confident in who you are and your purpose, it's smooth sailing. Find tools to help you discover your strengths. Out of all the things that you could do in the world, you chose the ones you chose for a reason. Find out the connection between those things and have it work for you. Yeah. Seek out community partners. Nothing can exist in a vacuum. I myself am a I can do it myself kind of lady, and it's been a big uh, eye opening experience to uh, open myself up to partnership. Uh, seek out experts who value the work that you're about to engage in. Continue learning, stay learning. Next, practice, practice, practice. Have faith in the work that you're doing, have faith in the work that you've done. You are ready. And also, Build, 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 build. Have no shame. Tell everyone what you're doing. Keep telling them. Find outlets. You, I mean, the world is small now. We can connect so much more easily than ever before. But that's not the only option. The face-to-face, -face, the connecting with your neighbors and your community is really where the magic happens. So next slide, Jim, please. That is all I have for today. And thank you so much for your time. Um, again, uh, my name is Howell Asana and I am the founder and managing director of Discerning Eye Community Agriculture. You can find us at backyardfarmingcooperative.com and a new website that will be coming soon, deca.farm. Also on Instagram at Deca City Farms or Facebook at Deca City Farms. And if you see the uh, final link, which is a link tree, there you can find uh, access to our volunteer portal, our YouTube page, our website, and our social media. And it's all right there in one place. So I'd really direct you to that link tree to find everything that you need. And we'll open it up to any questions or any comments that anyone has. And thanks for your time. Thanks, Hyla. That, that was really great. Uh, I've got a couple of questions queued up. Um, I, I'll take them a little bit out of order. I'm going to start with Tim's question. I'm going to uh, adjust it a bit. Um, so did you have any playbooks going started? I mean, how did what did you do for figuring out how to do this? Or is this all your vision just going from scratch? Or did you did you um, stand on anybody else's shoulders? Oh my gosh. First of all, um, thanks for using that phrase because um, 
just to say I wrote um, a, a poem that I'm really proud of that speaks to that exactly, standing on the shoulders of giants. And um, yes, of course, again, nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, but honestly, um, I didn't really wanna spend too much time talking about that in this presentation because Google is available. Really all I did was Google the things. I Googled urban farms and I found a business plan that is made specifically for urban farms and asked question by question by question and really provided a perfect framework for me to begin to have this idea manifest into something solid that makes sense. So really online resources are widely available and can take you step by step through the process. Now, as far as what DECA ended up becoming, um, it was a little bit of, an, like, like I said, past hobbies, past obsessions. I'm obsessed really with aquaponics and hydroponics and learning about sustainable growing techniques. So all of these things really came together to form what DECA had to be for me. Virtually. Go ahead, Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. You're the leader. All right. Let me let me just get through these uh, offered questions. Uh, Peggy asked about when you mentioned the PASA conference in 2020. Was there a workshop on agrivoltics? Agrivoltaics, I think. Agrivoltaics. I don't think so. But I suggest if that's something that you know about, you reach out because they're looking for. Um, uh, seminar and workshop leaders. So if that's something that you know about, I bet there is a wide audience that would be um, willing and very excited to learn about that. I don't think well, I know anything about agrivoltaics. Yeah, well, maybe I have a uh, related question. You showed a, a picture of a couple of sol solar panels next to um, some, you know, pods there. What was the electricity used for that the solar panels generated? Yeah, so... Was it for pumping? Sure, absolutely. What I had done, and honestly, in that particular demonstration, the solar panels were not enough. They were not sufficient, but it was a proof of concept. So um, I used the two solar panels and, uh, you know, the accessories, which are a controller, a rechargeable marine battery, and a few other electronics and things to, uh, and I had that sort of packed away in a tote hidden behind that whole structure. And those batteries and the solar panels powered pumps that would come on once an hour for about two minutes and pump the water through the manifold into the uh, PVC pipes in order to water the plants. And I had actually built it like a closed system. So on the ends, what you didn't see were two more totes on either end and pumps in those totes to pump the water back into the main uh, reservoir. So that was a really fun project. Um, the Again, the solar panels weren't enough to power the whole thing, but it powered it enough to show that it actually could work. All right, cool. Uh, any other questions from our audience? Tim, did you have a question? Yes. Um, you talked uh, a lot about this being urban farming, but just about everything that we saw in your presentation looked like it was out in the country. And I'm wondering, is the farming that you're trying to uh, address, is it something that's actually in the center of a city or is it actually in the periphery where there's lots of land and farmland? Sure. Well, uh, I think Lancaster City is quite a new, unique place um, in that we, have, for such a small city, we have a pretty large tract of green space almost in the middle of it, oh. um, which is Lancaster okay. County Park. So um, it's, I, I wish I could tell you how many acres it is at right now, but it is a pretty big space. Um, so it is almost like you know being out in the country which not a lot of right. small cities have that um advantage but you know since i am here this is what i'm going to take take advantage of well, um, now, go ahead uh -huh. 
So Philadelphia um, has got. Point, oh yeah, they're great. They're doing great at it. The Philadelphia is doing a lot of really great work with urban farming, and it's definitely a, a great inspiration uh, and a network to tap into. It's been great. Okay. Okay. I'll shut up now. now <laughs> that's all right that's a great question tim because yeah sometimes urban farming doesn't always look like uh what we expect it to and in some places it looks like rooftop gardening and rooftop farming um one of the big projects actually that uh unfortunately didn't come to fruition that came out of uh luffy lancaster urban farming initiative was a big uh, greenhouse on vertical greenhouse on the side of a parking garage right downtown. And I mean, it was a $500 million project or something crazy. It was like just really, really huge. And um, they had secured a good amount of funding for it. But, um, you know, with such a huge project, they sort of had to turn it over to people who were uh, more versed in that scale of project and it just sort of crumbled after that so it was really unfortunate mm. but urban farming can look like anything anywhere and um what i'll say actually is one of the things that we're working on currently like i said with uh langster um health and safety board is what kind of contractual obligations do we have to meet in order to regulate a backyard farming cooperative, which would look like in your backyard, you're growing either tons of basil or a variety of things, maybe even on your porch and you dedicate your space to just one thing. You can bring that to the market, bring it to backyard farming cooperative, we'll pay you market prices for it and sell it at our markets, right? Um, and this is something that we'd like to sort of encourage and really uh, begin as a thing here in Lancaster. There is uh, a few examples like this spotted around the country. There's a big one in Austin, Texas actually, and they've been a huge inspiration and actually handed over a lot of their um, incorporated incorporation materials like their articles of incorporation and other um, legal documents to help us in our process but every state is different every municipality is different so we're working with the city right now just to find out what is necessary for people to um, sort of uh, uh, align with in order to stay within the regulations so we can propagate this idea yeah. All right. All right. Th thanks, guys. I'm going to jump in here and uh, do the wrap up um, and then turn off the recording. And then if, if, if Hawa has time to stay on to just uh, chat some more. But let me let me do this uh, wrap up here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to our, our presenter, Hawa. Uh, this was a really, really great session. Uh, here are a couple of important websites. I encourage you to engage with your local Sierra Club group. Uh, find your group in the, in the Get Involved section of the chapter website. Uh, and again, uh, thank you to Hawa and, and find the Food and Ag uh, team um, website at, at the chapter website as well. Uh, Hawa has uh, shared her contact info. Uh, we'll be, um, let me just go to the next slide. Uh, we'll be uh, following up with a link to the recording for this section and any notes that we put together and contact info. Um, and we'll also invite everybody to uh, an upcoming food and agriculture team meeting. So be on the lookout for that. So uh, thank you all for that. I'm going to stop the share and where can I stop the recording?